As noted earlier, Scott wasn't a scientist, but through his work at the Martinet Printing House, he met enough scientists and learned enough about their pursuits to realize that the fledgling field of acoustics could benefit from an instrument that registered airborne sounds. In January 1857, he deposited his earliest experiments at the French Academy of Sciences, entered into the record by Academy members Claude Poulier, Henri-Victor Regnault, and Claude Bernard. About the same time, his work was noted by the Society of Encouragement for National Industry, a body established to promote ideas and technologies in service to French industry. The Society of Encouragement spawned into practice what the Academy of Sciences conceived in theory. The Society gave Scott the funds to register his initial March 1857 patent and to conduct experiments from spring through fall with members of the Society at his side. Members such as Jules Lisa Joux, a pioneer in the science of acoustics. Lisa Joux first demonstrated the figures that bear his name while working with Scott in 1857. Scott reported his progress to the Society late in 1857, complete with samples of phonograms. Lisa Zhu assembled these documents into the dossier we saw earlier as he undertook his evaluation for the Society's Committee of Economic Arts. On the surface, Lisa Zhu's evaluation is quite positive. It clearly states that Scott's original contribution was to trace the vibrations of airborne sounds onto a permanent medium over time. He wrote, and I paraphrase, If the apparatus were to measure only pitch and timbre, this would still be of great service to science. However, Mr. Scott, driven by an overly vivid imagination, seeks in these traces information of a higher order. He believes his apparatus can indicate articulation. We believe on this point he is completely in error. It would be wrong for us to dismiss Lisa Zhu's conclusion as short-sighted, as it was based on his legitimate concern about the accuracy of the phonograph's tracings, that is, the fidelity between the inscribed line and the sound that produced it. This would not be a concern, Lisa Zhu continued, if the movement of the membrane were the faithful translation of the motion of the air which agitates it, and if the motion of the stylus represented the motion of the membrane with the same facility. Unfortunately, he concluded, these intermediaries disfigure the vibration, exactly as a mirror of a regular surface modifies the aspect of a figure seen in it. So here's the crux of the problem that would frustrate Scott for the rest of his days. Limitations in the technology, limitations in acoustical theory, and limitations in his ability to demonstrate to the scientific establishment that there was more information in his phonographic tracings than met the eye. Today, we have that technology, and we can now state without reservation that both men were right. We can indeed coax from the trace recognizable sounds, interpretable words, the articulations that Scott believed were there. Yet, as Lisa Zhu feared, they are most certainly disfigured. Distorted as the vibrations may be, they open a window onto the following experiment that Lisa Zhu himself may have attended in 1857, an experiment to determine the phonograph's ability to record the timbre of a musical instrument. This is the earliest airborne sound reproduced to date. Let me be clear. Eau Claire remains humanity's first playable dated recording of its own voice. But this scale, played by an unidentified cornetist, holds the record for the earliest airborne sound recording reproduced to date. 1857, three years before Eau Claire de la Lune. 1857, 20 years before Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. 
1857, 31 years earlier than any recording any living person had heard before first sounds made the silent decade speak. Thank you.